business you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and shattered his legs, which made him easy prey for outlaws. His screams echoed through the war-ravaged valley. The wolves and ravens feasted on his body for days. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? No, sir, no, sir, I have no wool. I shall take no wife, hold no lands, father no children. I shall wear no crowns and win no glory. I shall die at my post. Little Miss Moppet sat on her toffet eating her curds and whey. And honeyed lemon cakes, thin leek soup, followed by a salad of green beans, onions, mounds of mashed turnips, jellied calf's brains, a thick venison barley stew, snails in honey and pigeon pie, and a lecce of stringy beef. Along came a spider who sat down beside her and shot her through the bowels with a crossbow. <laughs> Big thank you to the Word Zone for pointing out that uh, celebrity story time as seen on Think Progress. You can find it on YouTube.com. Brian Brushwood, how's it going? I'm Tom Merritt. Oh, my gosh. It feels like only yesterday we were hanging out there in Petaluma, California. Now look at us, separated by half a continent. How are you, sir? Were, were we hanging out yesterday? Sure. In our mad, I was definitely in your house just like a day and a half ago, but yeah, you weren't. But I wasn't there. <laughs> Oddly enough. But then we did frame rate together, and I don't know. Just, just, just. The point is that celebrity story time was awesome, and my favorite part was riffing on him for his extended passages about food. George R. R. Martin just keeps writing about food all the time. Yeah. It, in fact, if you're not a George R. R. Martin fan, it probably isn't as funny if you haven't read the books, but it's still pretty hilarious. Uh, I, you've been replaced, Brian, in sitting in physical proximity <laughs> to me by Glenn Rubenstein is with us today. Hey, what's up? Host of uh, Shut Up and Play, yeah. our land party on Sundays. Sunday evening, 7 o'clock. Catch it. Yeah. You could skip that show that's on right before <laughs> and just go right to the 7. seven. No, don't do that. You'll miss a lot of fun. I'll tell you what, though. If you watch Game On, you're going to miss epic moments like uh, like this from last week. This is uh, – we, we on Shut Up and Play, we had to, the losers had to slow dance. So there, there's me <laughs> slow dancing with Jeff Gershman. From you Fortnite. don't ever know what's going to happen on Shut Up and Play or Game On, for that matter. So <laughs> true, true. Check them both out Sundays. Sundays at 6 on your local Twit stations. <laughs> uh, let's start off with, uh, I don't know, big story. This just in, the big story. BitTorrent Live is going to kill television. Yesterday, Bram Cohen, who, by the way, is going to be on Triangulation this week on uh, Twit. That's Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Uh, has uh, demoed his latest creation at the SF Music Tech Summit. It's a way to use the BitTorrent protocol that shares the bandwidth of everyone to stream live television. So you stream it cheaply. Uh, you stream it reliably. He's been working on this for a, a long time. He says he's 99% uh, there and got rid of almost all the problems. And the quote is, my goal is to kill off television. Television's physical infrastructure is inevitably going to go away, but TV as a mode of con content consumption is here to stay, and he wants to be the way you get your TV. Well... I'll, I'll tell you, kudos to him for being the first person I've ever heard suggest that they were going to kill television. <laughs> Good on you. Uh, but, but seriously, if anything has the power to disrupt, I mean, certainly look at the way 
regular plain Jane BitTorrent has totally disrupted everything about the way media is consumed, whether it be you know from audiobooks to piracy to to uh, you know legitimate content like Revision Three. And uh, do do we use P two P here uh, on the Twit Network for our bandwidth? What do well, we do? In, in fact, yeah, we do for for in a lot of different ways, and we're going to be using the BitGravity uh, or I'm sorry, the BitTorrent uh, protocol that that Bram's promoting, and that's one of the reasons he's going to be here on uh, Triangulation on Wednesday. We will start using that BitTorrent Live way of delivering our content. That is awesome. And of course, the, the number one most important thing about this is uh, BitTorrent is unique in that uh, bandwidth restrictions totally get flipped on its head, where the more popular something becomes, the more people want to watch it, the the less bandwidth that it takes for any one person to have to provide. And that, uh, when, it, when you totally decentralize uh, television and live streaming, and all of a sudden it truly becomes... A, uh, I gotta wonder what they're gonna do about piracy on this when it's like, yeah, because right now, Justin TV and Ustream they have a lot of controls. You know, they, they're going around playing whack a mole whenever somebody's streaming the illegal copy of Wolverine back in the day or whatever else. But once it goes BitTorrent, I mean, how are you gonna control it? How are you gonna do anything? I predict we're gonna see some throttling. I think we're gonna see a return to the throttling we saw with uh, peer to peer. I think that ISPs, that's... You mean like packet killing? Yeah. ISPs going after this? Because they I look don't. at this as competition for their distribution methods. I think they'll get in worse trouble if they try to bother this. Remember, this is a proprietary protocol. This is not like the BitTorrent that you use to download files. This is something that you have to work with the BitTorrent company... If you want to make use of this, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they're talking to particular content publishers like Twit to take advantage of this now. So uh, I think they're not going to do the wide open anybody can use it at least to start. Mm -hmm. That way they don't have to play whack-a-mole. Well, I think once it opens up, though, in the long term, I think that could be a problem. I, I Well, and, and I... Yeah. I, and that's why I think if, if if they did open it up and you saw ISPs going and killing it, uh, they would get in a lot more trouble. Yeah. Because this they don't this is not going to be using too much bandwidth. The whole point of this is that it saves bandwidth. Yes, and I think it's a great idea. Well, so, so real quick, so uh, I understand that they want to start off with with uh, partners, and they do everything through BitTorrent. Is is it built into the very nature of of how it shares? Is is it not possible for there to be the twenty first century equivalent of pirate radio station or pirate television stations that uh, that that exist totally on their own using this same well, protocol? It could. It could, it could be, I don't know. We'll have to ask him about that. Uh, I, I, it may be that he's got an open source version that people can use, but they're not going to be able to use BitTorrent's. Uh, proprietary protocol uh, and SDK without BitTorrent allowing it, right? So it, it's sort of like, yeah, I guess somebody could reverse engineer this and come up with their own way of doing it. But the fact that it's shared on the user side doesn't... It, the same way that just because you're downloading a torrent from the Pirate Bay doesn't mean that you're implicating the BitTorrent company because you're not yeah. getting it from the company BitTorrent. Right. Well, and that's, I, I got to understand, and I know this is a dicey territory. This is the next frontier, right? So first we saw it with MP3s and piracy. See, then we saw it with video and piracy and, and takedowns, especially for, for offline content on YouTube. And eventually they got these uh, automatic flags that start to register stuff. As I understand it, and I've not seen anything, and this goes for, for all of the live streaming companies, I don't believe there is a way to real-time flag whether or not somebody's broadcasting something copyrighted at any given moment. And so as a result... There's gonna there there may I, I, th I think we're missing the point here, Brian. <laughs> I really do. I mean, you're, we're immediately talking about copyright issues. Yeah. This is not about that. This isn't about cod. Just because we're using the word BitTorrent, we shouldn't be throw like, oh well, the copyright problems are immediate. This is BitTorrent, the company. Yes, no, I'm talking to legitimate providers of video about yes. a way to provide live video that is cheap and easy. You're right. Uh, there's no reason I should mention uh, piracy because it's not like the last the, the last innovation from BitTorrent sparked a revolution that completely transformed the landscape and but brought it up. Didn't deep spark it in the company BitTorrent? No, no, it's not the company that's responsible. But I think that okay, one bit the technology. BitTorrent has an unfortunate association with piracy, and I think that that has hindered the company's growth and acceptance as a mainstream distribution platform. I think, though, uh, no better uh, place to look than Netflix and look how PO'd cable companies are about the Netflix bandwidth that, that's accounting for a staggering amount of data going across their networks. I think that they don't like... Having, they don't like that they've painted themselves into this corner with cord cutting, especially that they provide the much cheaper pipe for internet service, which is causing people to flee in, in sizable numbers from their much more expensive and profitable 
TV distribution service that's already in place. Now, the, the, the promise of this has the, de- the danger of any technology, Brian, and I know that's what you're getting at, which is, you know, every protocol, every technology can be used for copyright infringement. But it's because that's true that I I'm, I'm feel like that that's missing the point. It's yeah. like you could say this about any new technology and immediately go to like, well, what about the piracy? In fact, that's exactly what the industry wants you to do so that we don't get behind new technologies that do disrupt the industry. They want you to focus on that so that they can then bring the hammer down and say, and this is why it shouldn't be allowed to succeed, or we should legislate against it, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm trying to say is, this is a great service that can empower people who have legitimate streams to do it cheaply and easily. And that's why he's saying this is going to kill television, because it can allow everyone to broadcast. Now, Probably not the best soundbite. Probably not the best quote if they want to make friends. I'm, I'm sure, you know, tell that to Chris Dodd. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not going to... Because say, their stated mission is to kill television. Right, but he's saying the physical yeah. infrastructure. He does, no, totally. he does hasten to, uh, to point that out. Well, I mean, uh, yes, I, I agree. We should be excited for the technology. But seriously, we're going to... The P word is going to come back. <laughs> oh, it's already. I mean, you aren't going to be the, the first person to bring this up. Uh, but that that that's the unfortunate position that the MPAA and the RIAA have put all of our minds in. They've said when you talk about video on the Internet, you must talk about piracy. Yeah. And we and, yeah. and we've no, fallen and, for and it I, right I, here I, on the show. I will agree. That's it. That is a, an agonizingly frustrating uh, paradigm that they've boxed us into and we are all trapped in it. and I hate that uh, that it becomes the first thing that we think of and talk about on the show but y- you're right I mean this should be BitTorrent should be associated with small independent uh, broadcasters and ho- hopefully this will be the opportunity for them to do so yeah because you know what uh, most of the live streaming video out there is legitimate I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, there's whack-a-mole with the, the people pirating sports broadcasts, etc. Not that it doesn't happen, but that's that is not the majority of it, I don't think Absolutely. Let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Amazon's hiring you a TV executive? Looking for a job? Amazon's got some ads out. They're developing an original half-hour kids and comedy series for both online and traditional distribution, according to Tim Carmody at Wired. Uh, In fact, there's new job listings on their careers site that say they're looking for two creative executives for the People's Production Company uh, that's going to produce these shows. So... I like this. I don't really care about these types of shows for myself so yeah. much. Uh, I, I know that you might, Brian, because you've got kids. Dude, oh, yeah. I, I don't care. To me, the story is not at all what they're making. The fact is, no, is it's that piracy. they're piracy. No, oh, wait, no, 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 no. The fact is, is that they're stepping into the ring. And it's like, look, I, we've said this from the beginning. You know, I called Amazon the RC Cola of, of the mix between Netflix and Hulu. Uh, but uh, but Amazon needs to be in there. They need to keep everyone on their toes. And I, I tell you, man, they're very nimble and they're, they're last to join in the, the original content game. But I wonder if they're not playing it real smart. Smart, figuring out what works with other companies and keeping a toe in there so that they can jump in and be a player when they're ready to commit the resources to doing so. Uh, this is great. I, I love, I want to see more top quality content. And of course, you and I are both watching Lily Hammer on uh, Netflix. The, the more experiments like that we have, the more everybody wins on online video. I think it's a great idea. I think Amazon needs to do something like this if they want to be taken seriously at this point as as an online video powerhouse. I mean, they are playing catch up in a lot of ways, and I think that uh, I, I talked about this on a on a, uh, uh, a show I did on Spreecast a couple of weeks ago about the future of online video. And I almost wonder if Amazon could find a way to do a monthly membership for Prime if they would have more of a foothold. I think for some reason the seventy five dollars a month is what is or seventy five dollars a year rather right, you gotta is pay what's it all spook- at once. yeah pay it all it's at once. cheaper but you got to pay it all at once but I wonder if they almost did uh, a monthly version with some sort of prime like if they limited the shipping maybe like three packages a month but gave people you know if they just broke that down to a monthly cost of like six or seven bucks a month I think they would get a much larger foothold in in, in online video and remember this so, is so, the early days Amazon yeah. just launched their video streaming service last year yeah. Uh, and and they're already you know at fifteen thousand shows and growing all the time. We'll talk about the fact that they added Viacom later in mm-hmm. the show. So but, this- keep in mind also that they they also they don't advertise that you should join Amazon Prime for the video. Essentially, yeah. 
you get Amazon Prime for the for the shipping benefits. And then by the way, we're going to try out our new video service by just giving it to you for free because you're a friend. And here you are. Enjoy and, and, and run with it. So essentially, the video service itself is, is totally free. I can see if uh, I don't know. I almost wonder if. Amazon couldn't try on some kind of like Sam's Club pricing model where I guess that's essentially what they're doing with Amazon Prime, where where you get the benefit um, of being like a real member. But uh, but I agree. I, I, I think it's really interesting. And again, it's good to experiment here that they've stuck steadfastly to this seventy nine dollar year round membership. But especially with having all the Kindle tablets now with the Kindle Fire, I think that doing a monthly fee is, is a no brainer. Yeah, well, I think they will. I think when yeah. they get to the point that they're like Amazon Prime st Instant Streaming is a product that can stand on its own, they will they will market it as such. They will push it on the Kindle Fire. Uh, they'll push it on whatever other Kindles they've mm -hmm. got out there by that time. I think they're just slowly building building things in the background. They're building yeah. up blocks, uh, and probably by the end of this year, we'll start to see how it's all going to form but this is this is the early part of that because you know how long it takes to to produce a television show and get yeah. it out we won't be seeing this till 2013 so right. it's, this is part of the long con <laughs> the long, probably not best to refer to it as that <laughs> well i'm sure they don't refer to it internally but yes. totally what it the is they're trying to con you into buying their products that are worth paying money for it's a con Con. Willing, willing buyers and sellers conned into exchanging goods for services. All right, man. Do we have another big story? Uh, yeah, another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Now, we keep hearing about these earnings reports from cable television companies who say, you are not cutting the cord. It's the economy. That's all that's happening. Well, Nielsen has their own study out, and they have no dog in this fight because the, the cable, all the television, uh, television channels out there are going to buy the Nielsen ratings no matter what. They've got them locked in. Nielsen says the number of U.S. homes that have broadband internet but only free broadcast TV is is on the rise. It still represents only le uh, less than 5% of TV households, but that number has grown over 22% over the past year. In fact, 22.8%. So, well, and that is nothing to sneeze at. Keep in mind also, and, and yes, moving from what, like uh, from, you know, 4.2 to 5.1 looks looks insignificant. But you got to remember, that's the power of compound interest. That's the power of, of exponential growth. And that's uh, that's going to be huge. And it's going to be a factor, maybe not next month, maybe not even next year. But it, but it's it's a testament to that there's a growing subculture of people who are sick of traditional all you can eat buffet shoved down your throat from the from the big cable companies. Now, what number do you think it has to hit before the cable companies fight back or ten percent restrategize? Even just ten percent, even just ten percent mm. would be a huge, huge deal. Keep in mind, like look at look at what Apple is doing, having around ten percent of the PC market. It's a, and granted, they're of course involved in a lot of other things as well. But Apple is a factor for everyone now, and and, and as far as PC goes, there's still a very minor number out of out of all pcs out there so i would say 10 percent. I, I think that's a good benchmark as good as any i mean that's a, that's about the part that they're gonna they're gonna stop being able to say there is no cord cutting yeah five percent they can still maybe say oh that that's still just an economic difference but the fact of the matter is nielsen uh emphasizing that you all are starting to snip away at those cords with your scissors <laughs> it's almost as though you're cutting them yeah. With your sisters and knives. <laughs> it really is sort of a weird hands. way to put it when you think about it. Like, you know, it's funny. When I, I moved into uh, the condo I bought in Oakland, mm -hmm. uh, the, the person who had lived there before had literally cut the cords. <laughs> <laughs> like the cable, like I don't know if she's got angry at her television, but the, all of the cable, I had to rerun cables because everything had been actually snipped. Actually snipped. She well, was the awesome. first cord cutter. Back in 2005. All right, let's take a quick break. Thank our sponsor. One of the ways uh, you can cut the cord is Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit is a way to get 30 days free Netflix. So if you don't have Netflix and you're thinking, I want to try out this internet streaming video. I want to have thousands and thousands of television shows and movies at my beck and call anytime I want to watch them and just watch whole seasons at once. I want to try the new series, Lilyhammer. You can do it all for free at Twit. Dot TV. I'm sorry, at netflix.com slash twit. Uh, but and if go to twit.tv first and just take a peek and see if we're doing anything interesting. If we're in reruns, yeah. then definitely. Then go then to netflix.com. Netflix.com slash twit. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the slipstream. <laughs> 
Now, here's a service that may cause concern amongst the cable companies. Mm. It's called Aereo. Uh, on its board is Barry Diller from IAC, so it's got yeah. a heavyweight name associated Used with it. Used to be a Fox, right? Uh, he started Fox, and yeah. IAC is uh, a huge heavyweight in the interactive television service, or I- interactive. Uh, they own College Humor, for instance. Mm. Uh, Barry Diller is a big name in Hollywood, and he is on the board. He's not the CEO, he's not an employee, of a company called Aereo that wants to provide you, for $12 a month, free over-the-air television streamed on the internet legally. Here's how, this is the clever way they're doing it. They have a million small antennas. So you are renting an antenna. That way no one can come in and say, oh, you're illegally retransmitting this. All they're doing is selling you access to an antenna. Okay, now hold on. Now, how is this different? Now, this is, of course, a picture of the antennas built onto all these cars where everyone has an antenna. But this sounds awfully similar to what we already dealt with. That what was that company that just got got canned? You talk about Filmon? Oh, oh, Zadiva with DVD with DVD DVD players. Yeah, right. Okay, but there's also Cablevision, which won a court case where they said we are just renting access to a DVR. Here's the here's here's the difference. In Zadiva's case, they were renting out the content. Mm-hmm. In Cablevision's case, they were renting out the box. Mm-hmm. And the box was mm-hmm. capable of receiving other things. So what they're doing here at Aereo, which I think is, is probably going to get them a lot farther, is they are renting a device. That device can receive content that can be received over the air. But that they, all they're saying is, we are, we're not going to put a DVD in the player you know, we're just going to have a device. It's got an antenna on it. It'll have 40 hours of DVR capability. It'll be just like the DVR in your home, the one that Cablevision was able to rent you long distance. So, yeah, it seems silly. Like, well, why can't I rent a DVD player yeah. over the Internet, but I can rent this? But that uh, that seems to be the case. That oh, seems to ridiculous. be the difference. What a ridiculous Rube Goldberg <laughs> clutch is our, is our copyright law. I mean, that's I'm sure that's the first time you've ever heard that sentiment on this show. No, that, yeah, <laughs> I, I, we're usually very uh, reverent of, of, of that. Um, but but I, I think this is clever because they're going to be able to get you the major broadcast networks yeah. uh, and the digital versions of them, the high-def digital alternates, over the Internet. Now, they are geolocating you, though. Mm. If you're, if they're going to start in New York City. And if you're outside of New York City, you will not be able to get your stream that you're paying for. You will only be able to stream it inside New York City. And so that's another difference, like, say, from Film on David Alke, where they were providing nationwide access. They're saying, no, this is going to be just like getting a cable service. You can't get it outside the region. And if you try to access it outside the region, we're going to block you off. Throw throw that one into the... The legal versus ethical conundrum. It's like, would it be bad to VPN to your own network back in New York in order to watch content that you should get because you're a New Yorker and you right, have a right. house? Spoof an IP address and well, all what's that. What's the difference between this and just having an over-the-air antenna with a DVR? Or is that what's meant to replace? You get to pay twelve dollars. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> well, uh, and and but you, you get an you old get TiVo anywhere, you know. huh? You, and you get to access it anywhere on on uh, whatever. Well, you device. could you could roll your own, right? Yeah. You could you could you could hook yeah. up a television antenna to a forty hour TiVo and a sling box, mm-hmm. and you've right. got this. But that's already going to cost you a pretty penny. Yeah, this, this is, is only twelve dollars a month. So I mean, if you already have that stuff, then yeah. it kind of doesn't make sense to do this. But also, you don't have to maintain that equipment. You don't have to go. Oh, wait a minute, there's a network connection problem, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. It's all done through the cloud. So as long as the service is up, you're able to get your stuff. Right. If right. you pair this with Hulu Plus and Netflix, does that make an effective? If I'm a New Yorker who can take advantage of this, I'm going to get 20 channels: CBS, NBC, Fox, ABC, PBS, CW, amongst others. Does that make an effective cord cutting? Pretty oh, close, uh, dude. It's the final. It's the final straw because that's the one thing we hear is blah blah sports live. And if it's a game you care about, it's probably already on. You know, on one of the broadcast networks, uh, and uh, and and news, I guess. And a, a few yeah, prime but not t- cable news though. I mean, sure. you're not you're not getting ESPN. You're not yeah. getting CNN. You're not getting Fox News. I mean, you can yeah, just CNN over your guys- device, but only if you have a cable subscription, which is weird. Right. The Comcast authentication. Is that, is that, is that, is there no, uh, and I'm sure the chat room will, uh, you know, keep us up to date on this, but I could have sworn at least one, and I'm sure maybe they're, you know, I'm sure they try stuff out and then give it up, but I thought at least one of the major cable networks had like a live stream available at all times. Maybe I was thinking of like Fox Business or something. 
I don't know. Uh, almost none of the actual big cable channels. None. I, I would say none of the really desirable big yeah. cable channels stream their channel online for free. They did for a while. In 2008, uh, I remember watching election night. I had my, like... Epicenter set up where I had picture in picture going with uh, Fox and CNN and then MSNBC streaming on a laptop at the same time. Yeah, people, if, uh, uh, different channels have tried it from time yeah. to time. You're right. What about Russia Today or Al Jazeera? Do those guys have live streams? Yeah, Al Jazeera you can get for free. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's all a matter of what you're what, – I, I thought where you're going with the sports thing is, well, most of most of the channels you want will be available. But what if I want to watch the Knicks and they're on MSG, which they're not right now because of a carriage fight, huh? hilariously. But, uh, you know, if I'm in New York, I can't get that. I can't get the Yankees when they're on the Yes Network uh, because that's cable. I, I do think that this will slowly push, especially smaller cable channels, into wanting to be a part of this. Yeah. Although I tell oh, you, I'm sorry, Brian, what were you going to say? Oh, no, well, I mean, no, I think this is a good, um, uh, now, this is something I hadn't considered. Like, as a service by itself, this seems like a very small benefit for, for I, are they really charging 12 bucks a month for this service, yeah. essentially? Uh, that, that's that's too high a price. But if, if this is the kind of thing where this is a bridge to complete your cord cutting strategy, and then they establish a fan base, and essentially they come up and they say, we own the cord cutting market. Everyone who wants to cut the cord is with us. Let us now begin to negotiate individual deals between, and I don't know if they've got exclusives with the big cable companies or whatever, but this could be the foot in the door, the legitimate legal toehold that allows them to start going around collecting all the other deals to where eventually, 10 years from now, five years from now, maybe even three years from now, these guys are essentially a completely virtual cable company. Yeah, I just think about it from like a dorky TV consumer point of view where through VPN or whatever magic, I would I would gladly pay $12 a month to have one account in New York, another 12 for one in Toronto, and another 12 for one in London. Uh -huh. and just VPN in just to get that content as it comes out and not have to be at the whim of whatever, you know, I can VPN into iPlay or a way for somebody to pirate. Now, if I pay, and, uh, granted, I'm going to do 30 days free with Netflix.com slash twit, but then I pay $8 a month uh, for for Netflix. Let's say I pay, what is it, seven? Is it $8 a month for Hulu Plus? I think it's or is it 10. Seven? I thought it was 10. Maybe it's No, they reduced it at reduced one point. It so I think it's seven ninety nine. Uh, so so eight six. 16, 12, 20, uh, now I'm paying $28 a month for Hulu Plus, Netflix, and local channels. Yeah. That's starting to sound like a cable, like a basic cable package, and I'm not getting ESPN. Certainly, certainly I'm possible. not getting my local Comcast Sports or Fox Sports Net. Yeah. It's if tough. those are important to me. But the cable, the cable never comes, aside from promotional offers, it never ends up being under $100 a month. Unless you can complain re regularly. Yeah, if you yeah. actually, that's the best strategy. If you complain on a semi annual basis, they will knock it back down to a promotional offer. Yeah. Which, which is, I think, what keeps a lot of people from cord cutting. They make it so attractive. If you don't care about sports or uh, rather inadequate news services, <laughs> this will work great for you. <laughs> uh, Google is updating YouTube for Google TV. Uh, it will make it easier to navigate the video service on its connected sets. Uh, it makes it easier to find channels. I think this is definitely laying the groundwork for YouTube's launch of more channels this year to be used yes. on Google TV more often. And this comes in conjunction with them telling video makers who they have agreements with. I'm not talking about your regular everyday Joe who just uploads a video, but if you're a partner... Uh, you will now have to agree to allow your content to be seen on all platforms YouTube is available on. Yeah, now there are carve outs, of course, like the Vivo content. If you're those big guys, enough, right? Music, yeah. You know, right. They're able to still require. And I wonder what happens when, I, I guess I guess that's not a partner issue. Once you hit partner level, it's a, I guess you have agreements for the music that you do have in there. You have a license directly from VMI ASCAP or whoever. But the uh, uh, I'll tell you what, this is great news because. Uh, if there's one thing we're seeing from Google of late, it's like once they get something in their in their mind, they will continue to refine. They're like the Borg, where it's like they'll take a step forward and then someone blows off their arm. They're like, well, apparently I need a shield around that arm. And then they'll co continue to walk forward. That's what we're seeing with their social strategy. And that's what we're seeing with the Google TV. Google TV is a great idea. Bringing the, the surfing experience to the living room is something I think we all want. And I think this is an important step that they double down on their commitment to it, despite how the Logitech review did.
You used to make a YouTube video. Would this, yes. have, bo- would this have bothered you back then? Would, no, do you think I mean, it would bother to you? Being the partner program, I mean, with Lonely Girl 15, once that became serious, then it was like, okay, we're not using any, you know, licensed music. I mean, if you look back in the early videos, there's somewhere, there's music that there wasn't permission for at the time. You know, it was just sort of taking a chance with it. Was it an ask for forgiveness situation? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But uh, I think once we got more serious about it, then it was, we had, you know, the rights and sign off on everything. So I think it's to be expected. I think the trickier stuff um, from a content creator perspective, point of view was when YouTube started saying like, you know, hey, we don't want you doing your own sponsorship uh, things or having multiple sponsors per video. That That's mm-hmm. where it got kind of weird. But I think just allowing them to distribute your content to all platforms, I think that's sort of a no-brainer. If you're serious about it. Yeah. Now, I teased this one earlier. Uh, Viacom struck a deal with Amazon uh, to include their programming in the Amazon Instant Prime stream. Uh, so stuff from Comedy Central, MTV, Nickelodeon, uh, all going to show up in their Chappelle show, Sarah Silverman program, Jersey Shore, those kinds of shows will now be available on Amazon Instant Prime. How, I don't know, you guys, how, mu- how much of a big difference does it make? Obviously, Amazon needs to strike more and more of these deals. Yeah. I'm not sure this is the one that sways me over, but maybe it will sway some people. I think they well, need to do something more bold. I'm sorry, Brian, what were you going to say? Uh, well, I was gonna. I was gonna ask: Does Viacom have any similar deals with Hulu or Netflix? Yeah, or? they have a deal with Netflix. Okay, they do not uh-huh. have a deal with Hulu that is similar to this. Although they do have a deal with Hulu because yeah. you can't get uh, like Daily Show on on Hulu. No, I think they need to do something bigger and bolder. You know, when I saw there was Viacom and they talk about MTV, I thought it was going to be the dream of that I've talked about before of, you know, we're going to take old MTV programming, stuff that's not been released on DVD, not the same shows you see again and again and again. You want to see... Um, I want to see Remote Control. I want to see every episode of Remote Control. <laughs> and I want to be able to watch old episodes of the Top 20 Countdown with Adam Curry with the hair farm. You know, I mean, I want, I want them to really go you bold You want Headbangers Ball. I, I definitely want Headbangers yeah. Ball in right. 120 minutes. And what was her name? Martha? Martha Quinn. Martha Quinn, yeah. I, I, I'm kind of hoping that comes now that you mention it, too. <laughs> uh, finally, Amazon blocking instant video on Blackberries. Why? They say it's Apple's fault. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is, I, I, this is I'm weird. Not I read this entire story, and I couldn't make heads or tails about it and I read it again and then I was like I was going to ask Tom to explain this because no it's not Blackberry phones it's Blackberry playbooks so if you so it's affecting a very small number of people but if you have a Blackberry playbook which can play flash video you should be able to watch Amazon instant video because Amazon Mm -hmm. instant video plays in flash and in fact up till recently you could suddenly now Amazon is blocking it and their statement uh, says at this time the playbook is not a supported device for Amazon instant video Uh, Apple has exclusive rights to the hardware and software that would make it possible for Amazon.com to provide Amazon Instant Videos for these devices. Because of these restrictions, we are unable to offer compatible video content at this time. Now, I have a few theories. Uh, the, the person at CIO.com that wrote this, uh, what's, his, what's his name, Al Sacco, basically calls Amazon's uh, customer support idiots. He's like, I have no idea how this would happen. My guess is it's a typo. Mm. My guess what? is it's supposed to say... RIM has exclusive rights to the hardware and software that make it possible for Amazon to provide Amazon Instant Videos. And they're trying to say that they feel like they would be violating a patent somehow uh, to deliver this on the playbook. Or that there's something on the playbook that is incompatible with their current DRM. Maybe they changed the way the DRM worked. Because that's always that was always the problem with Netflix on platforms, was that they had to implement a certain kind of DRM on that platform to get it to work. That's why Netflix took a long time to show up on Xbox, etc. Yeah. So it may be that it has something to do with the way RIM handles Amazon's video. I can't imagine it has anything to do with Apple, though. That's just... That seems a little weird. Yeah. I agree. Weird. I, Weirdness abounds in this story. <laughs> if I can this watch it on my touchpad, though, hate. I'm happy. That's all I, 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 I hate being such a dumb tech outsider because, like, whenever we get into patents and who owns what, my eyes just glaze over. And I just think, like, well, this is all stupid. Well, and, and even the, the idea of it being RIM is a little bit on the outside of possibility, although I can yeah. imagine a situation where it might happen. Uh, it seems weird that it would have worked up until recently, but who knows? Uh, it, it, it would definitely not be an issue with apple for hardware they say hard apple makes the hardware it's like no apple doesn't doesn't make the hardware that requires allows you to play hmm. amazon videos on a rim playbook and right. apple's not involved in any part of that as far as we know so what's this uh what's the story roku plays nice with the cable guys what's this all about 
Uh, uh, you you, you want to go into tube tops? Is that what you're saying? Oh, wait. Is that your head? It's all your fault, Brush. <laughs> but we okay. are. Oh, crap. You know what? I accidentally paged down and I randomly, I thought I was looking at the last story in our section. And instead, I was looking at the last story in tube tops. Oh, but let's make it the first Sorry story in tube tops. Uh, Roku is uh, is is teaming up with uh, Comcast and Verizon and others working on a platform that would allow them to create apps for the Roku platform. Now, you probably still have to pay for the cable service. This isn't necessarily a cord-cutting situation, but it would allow you, if you use Roku for a lot of things like Netflix or Hulu Plus or HBO Go or et cetera, you would then be able to continue to watch shows from your cable provider in an app in your Roku without having to switch to another device. Uh, dude, that's great. Yeah, and redundancy is fine. I mean, uh, Bill Meeks in the chat room said that seems a little bit pointless, and I guess theoretically it is. But but that's uh, re- redundancy is the first step to naturalizing the use of one device over another. That's why it's important that we have HBO Go. You know, because obviously if you're there at your house and you could watch it downstairs. Same thing with the Time Warner app, being able to watch on your iPad, making your iPad into a television like device rather than having to you know walk all the way out to your living room to watch something like that. That's that's all good, and I think it's all a step in the right direction. By the way, as far uh, <laughs> a monkey stick says, I didn't screw up the story. I just used a warp zone to get to the uh, content of the episode. <laughs> well, and Kuhan points out like, yeah, it's about Roku, which is tube tops, but it's also about the service, which yeah. is Slipstream. So... That's, that's what I was thinking. That's what yeah. I was... That's, that's what, what, I totally call understand. out a segue like that. I, was, I thought I was so subtle about all that. <laughs> But I think a lot of people also, I mean, in my case, like we have a home theater PC upstairs, but not a cable out. We have cable downstairs. We just didn't bother to get a separate box upstairs. So if you have Roku in one room where you don't have your, uh, you know, a cable receiver, definitely there's a plus there. They, they, absolutely. Uh, you, you might be able to use Boxy for this sort of stuff, uh, although they are upset over an FCC proposal that would allow the encryption of basic cable programming. Uh, last month, we, we talked about Boxy releasing their TV dongle that allows you to watch analog broadcasts or analog cable or digital cue cam over the Boxy box with the dongle. And that exists, I mean, not QCAM, but QAM. That exists because of an FCC requirement saying that a certain number of channels need to be delivered in this way by cable companies. They have waived it in one case, maybe a, maybe more than one, but they've waived it particularly in one case for cable vision. And now the FCC is saying they may just drop that requirement overall because so many people have boxes already. Uh, the idea of requiring cable companies to provide boxless service uh, isn't necessary anymore. Mm. And Boxy's over there saying, wait a minute, like it's not even just losing the analog channels. There's digital channels that our dongle can have. And now we're not going to be able to provide them. It makes our dongle useless except for over the air broadcasts. I'll tell you what, man, I really, uh, I mean, if this, if this is the twilight for analog cable, I'm really sad because in many ways for 20 plus years now, I've had an inferior channel flipping experience than what I did on my old straight up analog uh, TV because when you had analog TV it really was you could hit the remote and as fast as you could hit the button is how fast you would be displaying different yeah. elements of, of a show and you could instantly like tick, 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 oh boobies and then go back and see it or something uh, whereas now it's like this this two second lag of change channel wait oh it's Mythbusters change channel wait oh it's Sean Hannity change channel wait well it's Anderson Cooper. You know, it's, it's, I, I hate all of it. And it's like, uh, there's some part of me that doesn't wonder if there's not money to be made in a channel flipping experience that essentially pre buffers channels above and below where you are. ATT so that you you first see. apparently does that. Uh, be glad you never had a direct TV, Brian. Because with that, with the satellite, man, those pauses, those got me. <laughs> but as uh, brutal, right? As uh, Pete Alejante in the chat, though, was saying the last thing you want on Valentine's Day is a useless dongle. That's absolutely true. <laughs> uh, finally, an Apple TV update may be looming because retailers are running out of Apple TVs. At least uh, that's according to Intel from Best Buy sources speaking to 9 to 5 Mac. Apple TV is not just out of stock at the source's local stores, but the product is no longer even shipping to retail outlets. Now... We heard today Tim Cook in a uh, addressing a conference saying that Apple TV is just a hobby, but I'm addicted. All the things he said before. Mm. So he didn't make any indication that something new is coming, but then he wouldn't, right? So I don't know. We got an iPad announcement probably coming March 7th. Well, this, this being a hobby, a- would they tack on an Apple TV announcement with it? It would be interesting. Uh, 
didn't we also have a similar situation? I think it was a year ago with one of the iPhones when they started to run out and, and exactly on cue they announced the availability of the next of the next iPhone. So I, I would believe this more than I would believe most of the Apple rumors out there. Yeah, again, these are just rumors. And if you somebody in the chat room is like, my local news just announced that a new HD iPad will come out March 7th. That's rumor. It may be very credible rumor, and that may actually end up being true. But Apple has not announced anything, uh, even with an Apple TV. Let's move on to Film Found. This is also a rumor, but Bloomberg uh, says they've confirmed that the next original series from Netflix will be Orange is the New Black, a comedy from Genji Kohan, the creator of Weeds. That's the show that runs on Showtime. Based on the memoir of a communications executive who served time for drug charges in a women's prison. I think this is a great idea. This is an untapped uh, Oz for chicks uh, or uh, hyper <laughs> They had that. There was an Australian series that was like Oz, but in a women's prison, Brian. Okay, you well then by all means, get this. It's a terrible idea suddenly. Yeah. No, this is a great idea. I would totally tune in for this. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I, I think this is pretty cool. Liz Friedman, co-exec uh, from House, is on the uh, is on the project, allegedly, according to Deadline's previous report. Uh, it would be the Dude, second it's, show it's... whose production is financed by Netflix. The company also has exclusive distribution rights to Lilyhammer, which is out now, mm -hmm. as well as new episodes of Arrested Development planned for 2013. House of Cards is the other one that is out that Netflix is directly backing. So this would be their second one that they are making rather than saying, well, somebody else is making it and we're going to get distribution rights for it in the U.S. If it's Genji Cohen, uh, if there's one thing I've learned from Weeds, this thing's going to be a money magnet because if it's a woman's prison, expect sexy cat fights, and that's money in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look for some announcements next week, and then we can find out when it would be available. But the TechCrunch article says that the uh, original shows should be available for streaming by mid-2013. So that would put it probably after House of Cards comes out in that sort of rolling number of new shows that they're, they're putting out there. Also, a uh, new trailer for Iron Sky. Thanks to Aaron B. for sending this one in. Uh, it premiered at the Berlin International Film Festival in February. Opens in theaters in April 2012. With Finland opening on the 4th of April and Germany on the 5th of April. Uh, and this is this is a big indie. It's, uh, some people even, even talk about it as being the kind of indie that web-only production makes. But it's it's got high production value. We've talked about it before on Frame Rate. I'll tell you what. Uh, what's significant about this is I hear rumblings. You know, we always I like to keep a few friends on my email lists who, uh, who even though they send me uh, old annoying crap over and over and over again, I don't unsubscribe because it lets me know what's going on in the grandpa circuit. And uh, a couple of friends of mine forwarded me this, like, "Oh, I'm gee, this looks crazy." So it's it's breaking out of the the inbred internet circles. And uh, so I, I, I think there's something to this. I think obviously the graphics are cool. It's a crazy enough idea that uh, that I'll have the kitsch value. Um, I, I want to see it. That's for sure. Yeah, and I, I, I've wanted to see it since I heard the premise that Nazis lived on the dark side of the moon and they're coming back to Earth. I mean, that just that sounds like an interesting sci-fi story. Uh, which, by the way, was was a Robert Heinlein story. Uh, that was it. Uh, I forget which one it is. Chat room will have it for me. Oh, in never mind. It's derivative. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 like but now it's being it's being uh, pitched ironically. It was not ironic when Heinlein wrote it in the 1950s. Right, the right. That's a good point. Like eight years defeated. Also, uh, an internet favorite that has a trailer out, and this is a this is a big movie studio production. But Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, came out with a new trailer, and let me tell you, Abe. Never looked so good. I'm very excited about this movie. I, I, mean, I was excited about the book, too. I just like the premise. The noise of thunder. And I looked, and behold, was death. To sing, come and see. That is a pretty credible looking Lincoln, I think. And there he goes to slay it. So, audio listeners, you're going to have to go uh, 
check out the link uh, for this because there's not a lot in the trailer for audio only. But I don't know. What there, do you think? There was a, there's a tweet I saw recently that I think is so true. Somebody, uh, and I wish I could credit it properly and I wish I could remember the other half of it, but it's like he says, uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter is going to be huge. I'm talking snakes on a plane huge. <laughs> oh. I'm talking, you know, and, he, and he went oh. on to mention another internet hyped movie that, of course, yeah. went where. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think um, I think what works in print... Here's the problem. is In print, it's it's fun to read those mashup novels because you know they're based in, in real historical documents and, mm-hmm. you know, just with the addition of vampires. But, but translated to a movie, especially when you got all this crazy flipping around and, and you know, kung fu, wire fu, CGI stuff, it just... It, it, it makes it too much. And you're like, oh, wait, I'm just watching a dumb movie about... A vampire hunting Abraham Lincoln. Well, and it was kind of a joke. I mean, Party Down, they used it as kind of a joke. There was a project that was Edgar Allan Poe, Vampire Hunter with a young Lincoln, young Abraham Lincoln in it. So yeah. that's, that's what it made me think of when this was first announced. I was just like, they should get Adam Scott because he was supposed to be up for young Lincoln in the yeah, show. Yeah, I know. I mean, who would want to see uh, people dressed up in weird costumes running around, you know, fighting an, an, an evil enemy? That's just a stupid <laughs> idea for a movie. <laughs> Here's the difference is you want to lose yourself in that experience and win the t- when the premise itself is such a joke and it you know throws it back in your face it's an uncomfortable mirror and then you realize like oh i'm behind it it's one of those things where it's like uh there are bands that play that game you know the the, the big hair bands in the 80s where they were so far out there that you loved them until you were able to hold up a mirror to it and then all of a sudden you, you just wanted to disclaim that you ever liked any of them and then grunge comes up to replace it and of course it became a parody of itself as well uh, the the problem is like you don't want to feel stupid for liking something dumb and and certain things you get it right up to that line and it's good you get that matrix experience but they go too far and you get what i'm afraid you, then you get that snakes plain experience. But it's beating Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. It's beating some of the other sort of high concept. I don't know, though. I think after Cowboys and Aliens, though, people are a little sick maybe of the super high concept, you know, Mm. like like it was almost engineered for fanboys. All right. What about Space 2099? That is... I have watched Space 1999, but I hear tremendous things about it, and I love, and and if my experience with Battlestar Galactica has, uh, has told me anything, it's that dormant franchises who can be rebooted or restarted or started back up can be some of the greatest things in all of sci-fi. So I'm, I'm optimistic about it, not even knowing anything about 1999. Uh, Jace Hall, the producer, spoke with io9. He says they want to make the show more plausible. Mm-hmm. Space 1999 was about the moon getting knocked out of orbit and everybody who's on it now are traveling around the, the galaxy in the moon, stopping at planets <laughs> as if the moon's a big spaceship. Uh, it's apparently not going to be quite like that. Uh, and uh, he, he explained that it's not even going to be a dark, gritty reboot like we've seen. Yeah. It's just going to be like uh, a, a trying to tell tales that people today care about set in space. That's great, man. And I'll tell you, that's another lesson you got from Battlestar Galactica is tell stories that you care about. And and uh, the backdrop is just extra pretty material to, to sink your mind into. And if this succeeds, next up, Buck Rogers. Oh, my God. Back. That is so ripe for a reboot. You're and so- tweaky. Please bring back Tweaky. I I would like to point out that uh, in the great list of life achievements, among the very topmost was when we got, uh, is it Gil Gerard? Is that the guy who played him? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. At at Dragon Con, we got got Bach Rogers to look into the camera and say, may the force be with you. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's look at what's premiering this week. Premiering this week. This is what's premiering this week. Check it out. See? <laughs> like that, Bill Meeks, Bill Meeks. <laughs> has taken Very what you polished. did last week Very polished. <laughs> and it's there. It's done. Uh, thank goodness that the summer movie draft will start at some point. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ghost Rider to- Spirit of Vengeance. That's right. You didn't know you needed another Ghost Rider movie, but you do. And it's coming out. This week, former stuntman and bounty hunter of Rogue Demons, Johnny Blaze, has been living in self-imposed exile, believing that his powers are a curse. But when he is approached by a member of a monastic order who is looking for someone to protect a mother and her son who are being pursued by the devil in the figure of a man named Rourke, Ghost Rider has to take the case. What's he going right. to uh, What he's going to do is not even comment on this movie and instead move on to what we're watching. <laughs> What we're 
watching. All right, let's get it right out of the way at the top. Walking Dead? Uh, no, not, not yet. Walking Dead? Uh, yes. Yes, I watched Walking Dead. So we're trying not to spoil for Glenn yet. It's, it's hey, you know, now I feel like already, if I start watching the show, I'm gonna I'm preparing myself that the first season's going to be incredible, and the second season I'm going to be wildly disappointed. So Safe what did bet. you think of the season reboot? Me? Yes. Uh, starting back up? Uh, okay, look. I spent, um, eh, spoiler alert, yellow, I guess. I spent the first 40 minutes just like, I'm done. I give up. This was your chance. And it's more boring sitting around talking and talking and wishing and thinking about possibly wishing having something happen. And hoping. And, then, and slaying and then, those and zombies. completely randomly with no justification, a random person puts herself in danger and then gets knocked off the side of the road. You don't know if she's live or not. It was so utterly, it made no sense whatsoever. Uh, and then, and then, and then it's like, oh, maybe something's going to change. And instead, send, send, drunk Herschel looks exactly like sober Herschel, only he's sitting in a bar. And then, uh, but, but I will say that despite all that, the standoff and the focus on away from the zombies as the danger, but other people as the danger, there was a moment of electricity there. But I'll tell you what, man, you got this much left. Walking Dead for audio listeners. Uh, three nanometers is how close my fingers are together. You know, I uh, liked it a lot better than you this time. Uh, I did feel like I was reading the io9 post that leaked out what the show was going to be about because it was note for <laughs> note. Herschel's in a bar and they're all concerned about the fallout and what they're going to do next, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I did uh, in that way, that leak was kind of spoilery, but I, I didn't mind it I, 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 because I know where that leak went. As to what happens next, and I'm so excited about that that I'm like, all right, all right, I'm good. Let's uh, let's it's, get let's get to the next general, bit. In general, it was this unnecessary parade of because they've got a lot of characters in the show, and so it was, it was almost like an SNL skit where like each one had to step up and say something. Like, here's a sentence or two to remind you, I'm Dale. I don't like Shane. And you're like, I'm Shane. I sure am mad at everything, and I think people are stupid. It's like, ah, uh, it it was stupid. I I it don't okay. Uh, what about Lilyhammer? I I've watched three episodes now. Where are you at? Watched the second episode today. I'm liking it even more. It's 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 got its flaws. It's a little bit um, silly at times, but it's light and it's fun, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm going to keep. What on I'm watching. surprised is I I find it very predictable. I'm like, oh, yes. I know what's going to happen now. He's going to go and try to hunt the wolf, but right. I don't care. It's done. It's done well enough that it's fun, and and it's got a, it's quirky, and it's Norway. And I never lived in Norway like you did, but I still get that sort of like this must. This seems like a very Norwegian thing that they're making. Yes. They're poking fun at here. Uh, you know what I think is interesting is how much, and I'm only two episodes into it, but so far two for two, they're really riffing on the socialistic uh, aspects of, like, one of the appeals of this guy is that he doesn't give a rat's ass about what the rules are, and there's all these, like, oh, you can't just go out and get a job. You have to be placed in a job, and you can't just go out and, and open a business. You, you have can't to have a open a bar. Stuff. Yeah. Right. So I wonder, knowing that this is made by, by it's by a Norwegian company, Yeah, that's right. right. It was made I, for I, the Norwegian this, television station. Yeah, I wonder how much of this is tapping into some Norwegian angst about about well, the, uh, the the red tape. It's made by Norwegians, but Stephen and Zant, Stephen Van Zant is an executive producer on mm. it, uh, and I think he got a writer credit on one of the episodes. I thought I saw. I may, I may be wrong about that, but I imagine they basically said, you know, what would what it would be funny is if Stephen Van Zant's character from Sopranos came to Norway. We have these crazy ideas of how he would fit in if he tried to go, you know, come to Lillehammer uh, right. and hang out. Do you want to do it? And Stephen said, great. I'll tell you what what yeah. my character would react to. You tell me what the situations are, and it's gold. Yes, yes. Uh, look, I'm enjoying it immensely. I think it's adorable. Yes, it's predictable, but uh, it's just so fun. It's just so fun. It's like, you know, the, 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 the mobster seems don't really have any bite to them the way that um, the way that the Sopranos did. But again, it's such a such an interesting premise. And again, I'm predisposed for all the reasons I mentioned last week. Are you watching Lily Hammer? I am not. I'm okay, not but I know Hammer. you are watching the Hulu original. Yes, I'm watching Battleground. I started watching that today. It just premiered today. I like it because it's it's a look inside a Senate campaign uh, set in the state of Wisconsin. And it shows the – it's a behind the scenes, sort of like the documentary The War Room. So it's behind the scenes mockumentary of the day to day goings on and inner workings of a senatorial campaign. That's pretty cool. And, and yeah. th here, here we are talking about what we're watching, and two of the most compelling shows that we like the most 
amongst the three of us are only available on the internet. Well, Absolutely. perhaps not like the most, but you know, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep watching. It was funny. You, I know you didn't watch and Walking Dead. Not just the internet funny. I think a lot of times people, when it right. comes to original internet stuff, I think they look through you know rose colored like, glasses. Oh, it's like college humor thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think I think sometimes we give things a bit too much credit. But uh, no, Battleground, the first episode makes me want to watch more of it. Lily Hammer could be on HBO, and yeah. I wouldn't blink an eye. I I, w- I would buy it, heart and soul. Comic book man came on yeah. after Walking Dead. You got sucked in, huh? Okay. so... Uh, okay, so here's the thing. You remember last week I was saying that I'm predisposed to want to love Lily Hammer for 18 million reasons, you know, including having lived in Norway. I want Netflix. I want, I want uh, you know, an anti-cable show to succeed and all that. Uh, I also am predisposed to want comic book men to be awesome. I, I love, capital L-O-V-E, everything Kevin Smith is doing over at the Smodcast Network. Uh, I laugh so hard I am in physical pain when I listen to Smodcast. I, I listen to, to Stel- tell him, Steve, Dave. And I found myself absolutely bristling uncomfortably watching the show because it has all the trappings of, of a crappy knockoff of Pawn Stars. It, it has all the tropes you associate, all the four scenarios that are fake reality yeah. drive you nuts about television. It is, it is and I, what I tweeted out, uh, it, is, it is podcast gold dipped in TV feces, although I didn't say feces. I said another word. It's Such people shit. I love dressed up and acting like people I hate, and uh, it was very difficult. I I, all, I I turned it off after ten minutes because really? I was like, oh, you want to look at this. I finished when the first like, episode. I finished the whole it, thing. And this forced business, like let's have a contest for two weekends off. It's like I don't believe any of it, and I should. These guys, these are the most authentic guys with authentic passion out there, and I'm not feeling any of it. Somehow they're making it feel fake. Now, having said all that, uh, I have enough love for them and what they're doing that I will continue to watch it. But it was it was like chewing nails to sit through the rest of the first episode. Brian, so maybe I'm the only one. That's because Kevin Smith actually has very little to do with the show. Um, he was on Adam no. Carolla's podcast. They had it out. Kevin Smith and Adam Carolla had this feud. And he explained it was sort of an off-the-cuff reference, but saying that he actually has very little to do with comic book men. That's all AMC. So I think that's the reason why. Well, it, it shows. It, it looks like it's an AMC show that uh, is taking an outsider's view of, of what we're up to on the Internet. And I find the representations a little bit insulting. And I, I don't lo- like Like it. Big Bang it, Theory it, you know insulting? Was? No, I, I, I don't watch stupid sitcoms. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, I'll tell you what, though. It's 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 a minstrel show for for geeks. That's and how it, it, it the annoys me to see them put on the geek blackface and get up and do the dance. And uh, now, having said that, it's tough. It's tough to try to to pilot into a new medium here. But but it just I just got so mad repeatedly watching it, and I didn't want it. Still watching Fringe. Still loving Fringe. Please catch up. I will. I will. All right. I promise. Let's uh, let's move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Michelle writes in, hi, Tom and Brian. Just remember, Netflix announced that they would not be coming into the Australian New Zealand region due to the low broadband penetration and the lack of regional rights, none to be had. So HBO might be thinking to set up and sell to Netflix later. Uh, intriguing. I don't actually have. <laughs> do, do the fingers get? I don't think I like it's that. likely, but intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one comes from Bill Bass. Hey guys, great show on recent episodes of shows like Frame Rate and TNT. I've been hearing frequent mentions of gesture and or voice control for televisions, most often relating to the mythical Apple entry into the TV market. Am I the only one who thinks this is an absolutely horrible idea? Does anyone really want to listen to their partner who channel surfs during commercials, sitting there going channel? Up, channel up, channel up, channel up, or watch them flailing about wildly to accomplish the same goal. This just strikes me as a marketing strategy in an attempt to solve a problem that does not exist. I already have a gesture to control my TV. It's called picking up the universal remote, pointing it towards the TV, and pushing the appropriate button. It requires a bare minimum of effort, probably less than a gesture. It's silent, and it works correctly every single time. Am I missing something here? Thanks, and keep up the great work, Bill Bass. Dude, you know, Bill, let me read uh, uh, this. Uh, it's weird. We have this letter letter in an envelope from 1979 uh, it says i already have a way to control my tv it's called getting up off the couch and changing the channel it requires a bare minimum of effort probably less than this remote it's silent and it works correctly every time am i missing something here <laughs> from grandpa bass that we have that we happen to have we happen to have a time capsule from the 1970s here's the thing it's all about the implementation and i will agree 
free. Xbox is it's all promise and it's under delivery. It's neat to say it and here and and Siri is that uncanny valley between what we want interaction with an artificial intelligence to be and what it actually is where it's it works it's useful just enough of a time that it's worth it to keep going back to it but it messes up so much of the time that you just agonized and you're like why am i even bothering with this but in five years dude technology is going to change so much in the last five years where you'll just be able in the middle of a show, just say skip commercials, and all of a sudden it's just going to jump ahead for you automatically. Whilst you're going to walk into the room and say, "Hey, what's new?" and it's going to say, "You've got three episodes of MythBusters, and then also a new frame rate." You're like, uh, "Watch the queue up frame rate, and then two MythBusters, and then it'll happen." You're like, "Also edit out commercials and uh, send out invites to folks in my friend circles." This is going to happen, and it's going to happen in the next five years, and that is when the convenience will make it totally worth your while. I understand being skeptical now. But it's not going to be that way in the future. Do you? I, 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 everybody always complains, like, I don't want to see people flailing around. And I agree. I don't want to yeah. see people flailing around. But I think when this is done right, you will want it. When it isn't annoying, and I don't think it has to be annoying, you will want it. When you'll be able to, when it tracks your eye movement and it knows that you're looking at the right place on the screen to say, like, change channel, and all you got to do is that, I think it will be great and people will love it. We just aren't even close to that yet. You know what's yes. weird, though? And I would never pirate a TV show and watch it on my home theater PC, but God damn it, if double-clicking a show is not just an incredibly great. satisfying way to watch something. Yes. Just in theory. In theory. Right. But think about also, like, imagine when when the artificially intelligent, uh, context aware uh, interface is as good as having your wife stand by the computer. Then then you will win. They'll be like, like, uh, hey, volume, uh, no, no, uh, uh, right about, yeah, okay, no, right, right. good, yeah, good, yeah. yeah. And it, and then all of a sudden it's natural. And then it's the most natural way to inter to interface with technology. And we're getting close. I mean, it's like just, just seeing what's possible with Siri has me more optimistic about this working now than I've ever been in my entire life. Uh, and then JR says, just wanted to know if Tom still watches Being Human. Both versions aired new episodes oh. in the past two weeks. Major changes in the cast of the UK version and totally new character arcs in the US version. Your opinion would be great. Are you watching it? No, I'm not. But on Sci-Fi, uh, I'm intrigued by it because I have been watching Face Off, the uh, special mm. effects competition show. And Josh was a guest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's his name? Sam Huntington. Yeah. Who I'm convinced just took over Keith Coogan's career. Like, Keith Coogan got too old. Sam Huntington said, eh, it's like a younger version Maybe, of that guy. Maybe, yeah, he willed it yeah, to him or yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, no, uh, I've been watching that. I know he was a guest on there, but I love, love Face Off. Love the concept. I have been watching Being Human, the U.S. version. I haven't seen the U.K. version show up. Maybe my DVR is messing up, or maybe it's not on BBC America yet. I know it is airing in the U.K. Uh, but I, I really like the, the sci-fi U.S. version of Being Human independently. I like the UK one too. They did a good job of differentiating it where it's similar and it's got a lot of the things mm -hmm. I love about the UK version, but it's different enough that I'm not here sitting here going like, oh, well, like we do with Walking Dead. Well, that's different in the comic book. I'm not like, well, that was different in the UK version. They set it in Boston, changed most of the character names. Mm -hmm. They've got different things going on. Uh, I, I am watching it, JR, and I'm liking it. That's it for Frame Rate. Glenn Rubenstein, thanks for uh, Thank joining you for us. Thank you for having me. Once again, where can folks uh, follow you online? At Twitter, at Glenn Rubenstein. And also follow Schwood without a C. Yes, that's important. That's right. Hey, can I actually, and, and uh, I actually had it out over Twitter. Very rarely do I boldly uh, crap on something when I'm disappointed, but uh, Duff Jessica was uh, on Twitter, was nice enough to give a thoughtful response, and she's watching right now. Uh, I, I'm going to give comic book store men or comic book men more time, and I want it to work, but, I, but oh, I was not happy with the first episode. <laughs> you can catch both these guys every Sunday right here on Twit. Game On happens at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern. Eastern, followed immediately by Shut Up and Play, our Twitland party hosted by Glenn Rubenstein. Thanks, everybody, for watching Frame Rate. You can find us on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then.